Dr. Lori Marker, and I'm the founding director of the Cheetah Conservation Fund. This is Anna Key, and she's our manager of all of our uh, research and education that goes on here. We're going to show you through our museum, so come on and follow us. This is our education center here. Um, actually, right now, everything was built in thatch. We're rebuilding the thatch. Uh, we're using this period of time that we're closed down because we're in the COVID-19 time to um, fix things up as well. Come on into the museum. The museum here was dedicated to Catherine and Carl Hilker, and they're very, very longtime friends. Um, Catherine and Carl were from Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Zoo, and they actually have um, dedicated this also to the memory of Angel. And Angel is Catherine's first cheetah. And this goes back back into the 80s, 1980s, where she, Angel and Catherine did a lot of education programs with the Cincinnati Zoo. They love cheetahs, and that's why the museum has been dedicated to the three of them. So come on in. Our museum is set up into three different areas. We have first, this is the history room. And the cheetah actually has a very long history. And from this, the cheetah actually, um, a type of cheetah, started over in the, um, in the Americas and then crossed over the land bridges and then populated Africa and, and Asia. And they went through population bottlenecks. So what we try to do here in the museum is explain it. Anarchy brings kids through and how do you put all of that into kid language? Yeah. Um, and one of the really good things I love about this museum, like Lori mentioned, is it is divided up in sections, the history, the biology, the ecology, as well as the human wildlife conflicts uh, with the cheetahs at the moment. And what we do with the kids is they come on a they come and do a scavenger hunt here in all the three sections. So we give them a worksheet and they have to come and find answers to these questions, which is um, interesting and exciting while they learn at the same time. So, okay, well, you're going to have to put us through the scavenger <laughs> hunt as we go through. Um, this room basically is, that um, again, the history that the cheetahs have a very long history with humans. And as I always point out, that we as humans have um, really caused the cheetah to be loved to near extinction. Um, the cheetah has been revered for thousands of years. Kings, emperors, and princes use cheetahs um, for hunting, actually, to, to go hunting with them. They protected their throne even though the cheetah is not an aggressive animal. It's an animal that believes in flight versus fight. And it's been most easily tamed, and that's been one of its biggest problems. And throughout here, too, we've got great stories. We have a wonderful story, which is the Chewbacca story and the Makanja story. And actually, we have the Chewbacca story that we put into a, a kid's book. But the Makanja story is a, um, it, it goes hand in hand because that really tells the story of what a wild mother cheetah would do. Chewbacca, um, I hand raised from the time he was about 10 days old. He was an orphan. And so I tried to raise him up as naturally as um, his mother would. So this is a hand in hand story. And it goes throughout right, right. as well. Yeah, so, and which is also interesting. Um, the kids are much captivated because of the easy language that the stories are in. They come and stand here and they learn. And some of the, the, the names are in, you know, languages that they can relate to, which, which makes for very exciting learning when they come to the museum. And Makanjo, what did that mean? Makanjo is struggle. Struggle. Yeah. Of yeah. which, you know, yeah. Namibia went through its Absolutely. struggle. Yeah. And we are celebrating our 30th year anniversary at this point in time. Namibia is 30 years as well. Uh -huh. So there is a lot that goes into keeping, um, you know, growing Namibia, the growing of Namibia. So come on and follow on through. Um, I think that this is one of our most exciting walls here. Um, and this is the, the tree of cats. And every single one of these is in a different color pattern, I guess. So, for instance, the greens are the ocelot lineage. Yeah. And um, we've got the domestic cat lineage, which mm -hmm. are the wild cats. The serval lineage. Uh, well, the cheetah comes down here, and the puma and the jacarundi. These are the cheetah's closest relatives. Uh, and from this whole wall... Now here we've got the, the blue team, which are the lynx lineages, the bay cat lineage, 
the Asian cat lineage, and then the panther lineage, where a lot of people think that, well, the cheetah is a big cat. However, it is not um, related necessarily to the lion, jaguar, clouded leopard, snow leopard, tiger. The cheetah's closest relatives are the puma and the jacarundi, which the North American cougar, South American cougar, um, and cheetah are, are very, very similar where the cheetah actually had a distribution of, um, of life in North America at a long, long, long time ago. But one of the things that I point out on this is the fact that all of these cats, and there are about 32 species of cats, are threatened or endangered, primarily because of human wildlife conflict, issues with people, and the only cat that's not is the domestic cat. And we do love cats. Um, most people who have a cat love cats. So there's cat people and there's dog people. Uh, but for this, um, it's just beautiful. And this was painted by one of our um, colleagues, a lady named Elena, who actually now is in Kenya. She runs the Mara and um, uh, Meru Cheetah Project. But she was here, this is back in the 19, we opened up in 2000, so in 1999. She was here as a, a volunteer helping us, and she, we found out that she was an amazing artist. And every day she painted a picture. And so um, this took her over a month and a half to do. Mm -hmm. Wow. Uh, yeah. So this is a very special wall for us. All right. So this is where we show um, our kids that come to CCF about, you know, where cheetahs are found in Namibia. And exciting for them to know always is that Namibia is the cheetah capital of the world and Ochivarongo, which is about, or CCF, which is about right over here. And so one of the questions that we like to ask them is, you know, we ask them to guess how many cheetahs we have in the world and how many of those come from um, Namibia. And it's always um, interesting to see um, the expressions on their faces when we tell them how many few cheetahs are they especially when we compare the number of people in the world to the number of cheetahs um, in the world. Yeah, it's kind of scary, but yeah. this gives, you know, from where we're showing right here, this is what we call high density. Yeah. And yet even with that, you see maybe one cheetah per 1,000 square kilometers, which would be about how many, 800, 500 to 600 square miles. So, I mean, then we go into, we've now seen since the 30 years I've been here, in helping set up cheetah conservation, we've now been able to see the cheetahs move more to the west a bit, uh, primarily because of some of the community-based programs that we have going on, our conservancies, which Namibia is so famous for. And then over here, we talk about um, yeah, what the road to extinction, sadly. You know, what does this look like? In 1900, mm -hmm. we had lots of cheetahs. And then by 2000, we had very few, maybe 1,200, yeah. 1,500. Mm -hmm. And now we have less than 7,500 individuals. So they have a range, and this is um, interactive, which was fun. This was what it was like in 75 when I first started to work with cheetahs, um, that there were maybe about 30,000 cheetahs. And today, our populations are... Again, Namibia being the cheetah capital of the world, spread out with Botswana, the two largest population, and very fragmented small numbers. Um, up in here, we know that there are cheetahs, but you know there's probably only about 200 cheetahs up in that area. Yeah. It's a big desert. Mm -hmm. All the cheetahs are found in deserts, looking similar to what our landscape looks mm -hmm. like everywhere I go. Um, and so Iran, there's less than 30 to 50 cheetahs mm -hmm. there. So we've worked with most of these range countries, but that's what the world population looks like today. Okay, well, that's the history of cheetahs. Come on and let's go in and find out more about the biology. I think this is a good booster too. Okay. I'll explain this one a little. Here we've got an entire skeleton um, that you can learn a lot about the cheetah's body parts, um, what their, their, you know, paws look like, uh, and so this is also part of our, our learning area here. All right, so here we show our various uh, cats. We show how different their heights are. We show how different um, their spores are. We show how different their skulls are, how different they are in size, um, which makes for um, very interesting exhibition. Yeah. So, 
That's okay. <laughs> but it is. It's for the kids to be able to touch and feel. Right. And everybody love, wants to touch and feel. Right, right. And I think that's really important. For instance, here, what does a kudu feel like? And then with the kudu, I think we've got the kudu tracks in here as well to try to show what they look like. I know we've got, here's jackal tracks here. And many of these, um, you know, again, this is part of our education. We do a lot of um, game playing as yes, well. Yeah. So you get the tracks out and then the kids have to learn how, what the tracks look like. We used to have a lot of poop samples in here and you had to actually match the poop to the, um, the track, to the, to the, to the skin. Yeah. So, okay. Okay, we've come into our biology room um, and what we try to explain throughout the museum is that the cheetah is unique. And with this, they're fast, and we try to use some real fun um, graphics in here. And every time we see a sign like this, this shows and will tell about some of the unique characteristics of the cheetah. We know what the scientific name is, the genus, and all of that. And then um, over here, so here we have the cycle of life, and we have the four stages of the cheetah's life. And very interesting, again, because I am all for interesting or inter uh, making learning very interesting for kids, um, these stages are explained in detail around our museum. So the first stage of uh, a cheetah, for example, is the gestation period. And they get to learn more about that. And then when they leave the den, and then when they make the first successful hunt up to when they uh, uh, become adults, which is all very interesting. So come on and let's follow the track um, of the, the cycle, the life cycles. Um, this is the life cycle one, which is the birth. They've got a gestation of about 95 days. Um, the cubs are born usually out in the thick bush, which we've recently had some cubs born that we've been monitoring um, of our rewilded cheetahs, which is quite exciting. And then they stay in a den for about six weeks. And then from that, the mother will move them. So symptoms have come in. And at about six weeks of age, they start moving. I think their eyes open usually yeah. at about four to 10 days. And so that's like stage one. Now stage two. So stage two, at, it says at, at about uh, one and a half months of age, the cubs now safely leave the den um, uh, to accompany their mother. Uh, at this stage, they are also still very, very vulnerable, which we teach them. And what we also say is that um, a cheetah cub needs a lot of training from its mother to survive in the wild. And so we talk to them about, we link this stage to, you know, the cheetahs that we have here at the, at the center as to why we cannot release them, for example, because they've not had enough training um, with the mother to survive out there in the wild, uh, which is where they um, start going out with the mother and uh, learning some of that stuff. Stage three is as they start learning to kind of leave their mom at this point in time. So they will leave mom at about 18 to 22 months and the brothers and sisters stick together as a family unit because they are learned, they've learned how to hunt a bit from their mom, but they need each other to hunt better. And this is a real important time. At this point in time also, the female cubs will start coming into heat. And what will happen is the dominant males, as the female has gone through these very huge home ranges teaching your cubs how to live, dominant males will have picked up, oh, there's a couple young females out there and females do have mate choice. And those dominant males will push subordinate males, the young boys, the brothers away. And from that, then they will actually um, mate with, with a dominant male. And here we say, well, you know, what is diurnal? Mm -hmm. That means that cheetahs are nocturnal. Not, they're not nocturnal, right. which is nighttime. Yeah. Um, it means that they are active during the early hours of morning and evening, right. diurnal. Yeah. Now, okay. let's and then stage four, go. Over there <laughs> is when they have become uh, sexually mature, and here they start breeding and uh, making um, cubs of their own. And this is how we measure um, success of cheetahs that we release is if they are, if and when they are able to um, to breed in the wild. So this is yeah an exciting I guess stage for the cheetahs. Okay, so the biology room talks a lot about. Again, not only the life cycles, but uh, we start really with the abnormalities because cheetahs are a species that went through a genetic right. bottleneck about um, 10 to 12,000 years ago, leaving them genetically compromised. We found abnormalities within animals. We see focal palatine erosion. 
but he lowered crowded incisors, kink tails, and poor sperm quality. And we teach that because we are a research center, a biology right. section, yeah. um, and this is the biology room. Yeah. From that, a lot of people don't know the difference between uh, a cheat yeah. and a lover. Yeah. Can you tell the difference <laughs> between them? These. And uh, mo these have, leopards have what are called rosettas. And it's a yellow dot with black around it, where a cheetah has just polka dots. Yep. Um, and then the cheetah's the only cat that has these chair marks, yep. which are called mallor stripes, and they actually help them when they're hunting. Right. And there's very similar, with this mantle that runs down these cups back, is similar to what's called a honey badger or a tail, which is one of the most aggressive animals right. there is on the in the bush. Yeah. These guys can chase leopards away. I mean, lions away. We don't want to be around them. Yeah. And so it's actually a mimicry. Yeah. And you, we teach mimicry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then we've thrown our research throughout as well. Um, so of the numbers of cubs that we've had our hands on over all these years, just the, the, the data, how do you actually tell when you get a wild cat in that's been caught what its age is? And so with this, we explain what, how we um, describe it, you know, with, with their teeth, what, what their coloration of their spots, their hair mantle, location of mom. And this is something that we've been able to show their age groups and how their age yeah. and grow. Yeah. So we've tried to, again, sprinkle our research throughout here as well. Yeah. Um, and then throughout here, we've got a great skeleton um, of uh, one of our, our cheetahs to try to describe what its body looks like. Because learning how to um, hunt is cheetah cubs learn how to play. They learn how to hunt from their mom. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, we measure every animal. We know everything about it. Yeah, yeah what's the difference between the cheetah and the other cats as well? Um, cheetahs have more dog-like claws. Mm -hmm. They're always out. Um, Semi-non-retractable versus a cat's claws that are always in and a mm -hmm. dog's claws that are always out. And then, oh, can you identify <laughs> these? What is that one? That's... that's so all, when we're out in the bush, we constantly are looking for tracks. Right. Um, that's an African yeah. wild dog. That's yeah. the cheetah. Yeah. And you can see its right. claws yeah. when they're out. Yeah. And we also teach about, you know, uh, associating um, how the cheetah is built to, how, to its function of speed, basically. And so the tail, we'll talk about the tail, the spine, um, um, as well as the, so the, the, the strides, I guess. The, yes, the strides as well, the paws, the claws, and all how that is all related to, um, you know, making them efficient uh, hunters. And we do have touch and feel. So, you know, this is what a backbone looks like and how their hips go together. We talk about that because in order to run the way that they do, yeah. they have this very flexible um, backbone. And um, they've got these shoulder and hip girdles, which swivel, mm. which allow them to have these strides, a stride of about, mm, I'd say, eight meters. Yes. Yeah. And that's when all four feet have touched the ground. Right. And so we have actually um, games that we play with the kids yeah. as well. Um, then we, you know, what are Cheetah Olympics? <laughs> <laughs> Who do you think is going to win the race? And so what are the fastest animals in Africa? Is the elephant, it's big, oh, it's in fourth place. That's not bad. Oh, black mambas, we were talking about snakes earlier. Right. <laughs> the black mamba is one of the most poisonous. Thank God it's in ninth place. place. And where are we humans, humans, humans? <gasps> we're in seventh place. So we're a little bit faster than the black mamba, right, which right, is right. good. Yeah. Um, and of course the cheetah is in first place. Yeah. Um, and then what is the fastest? animal in the world, the peregrine falcon. So that is, remember, the cheetah is the fastest land animal. And then the, uh, the second fastest land animal in the world would be the peregrine antelope, which is a North American species and springs up to 800, uh, 86 kilometers per hour. And that's, yeah. remember, when the cheetah used to live in North America, it used to chase yeah. the pronghorn. So the second fastest land animal. Yeah. We also talk about skulls. I mean, the cheetah's got, it does not have a very large head, skull. This is a cheetah. And you can notice that it's got very, very small teeth compared to a leopard. 
um, on that. And I mean, look at these canine teeth of the leopard. I mean, right. whoa. Um, so everything about the cheetah has been built for speed. Right. And they can't go that fast if they have very heavy teeth, right. very heavy bones, body. Um, and so we compare the cheetah to all of the other um, African large carnivores, as well as some of the other um, species. These are all actually, there's a coyote from North America next to the jackal. Right. And then this is a saber-toothed cat. And you can, um, the cheetah was around this period of time that saber-toothed cats were here. We talk about how they see, they can see great distances. Right. Um, and then I, I've always liked this one, which is living fast and dying young, is that unfortunately cheetahs um, in the wild don't have that long of a lifespan mm -hmm. because they're spending most of their time in trying to find territory, right. marking territory, um, trying to find a mate mm -hmm. and breeding. And that's the work we've done here for years, studying how the cheetah lives in the wild. Okay. And so this is the communications. Uh, like all other species, cheetahs have different ways of communicating. Uh, they purr, they chip, but they do not roar like lions, um, like lions do. Uh, and so every uh, sound that they make says or communicates something specific um, to the other cheetahs, just like, you know, we would communicate you know, various things in the human language. Cheetahs also have a cheetah language. Okay, and this takes us into the ecology section of the museum. And from here, just you know, our news flashes that we talk about really are that, you know, the cheetah has a lot of threats. And what we talk about is what these threats look like and what our solutions are. And so Cheetah Conservation Fund is a solution-based organization. Yeah. Into our... Um, Ecology room, we find a cheetah up in a tree. Well, cheetahs don't climb trees the same way as most cats, but they do go to trees like this and they mark territory. They urinate, they defecate, and that is part of their territoriality. Right. Unfortunately, this is where the farmers have put a lot of cage traps over time and why we ended up here trying to stop the killing and the catching of the cheetahs. And these cage traps are, um, don't hurt the cheetah, but once the cheetahs were caught, they oftentimes would kill them. Uh, we do have a lot of orphan cats. We've been able to put back into the wild over 600 cheetahs that have been caught in cage traps like this that were not catching livestock. Um, so what we try to do here is to say, how does the cheetah actually live within the ecosystem? Um, and from this, we've done a lot of different research projects. We've done censusing, uh, radio telemetry, spore tracking, camera trapping, all understanding how the cheetah is living out here in the systems. And also, um, so what we also try to do is obviously link what we teach here at CCF to what the kids are learning in school. And so they learn about biomes. We ask them, for example, what is a biome? And they have to, and that is one of the scavenger hunt questions that we, that we ask them, uh, which makes for very um, uh, good learning for the kids. Um, and also, we try to understand um, animal movements here at CCF. We do a lot of studies um, to understand their movements, especially once we've released our cheetahs out in the wild, we want to know uh, how they're doing. And one way we do that is through um, coloring of our animals um, that we release out there to see how they're doing. Um, and so this is a transmitter. And so um, we have a computer that receives all the information about the cheetah and we are able to know where they are, what they are doing, and if they are all right. And with that, we show what habitats look like. Um, and this is a, a map, obviously, here. We are um, at the Cheetah Conservation Fund. We're, we're actually right here. This is a caracal that we had tracked. Male cheetahs, again, uh, we're based right here. A female cheetah, which has a huge home range. It's not the right color. You might not be able to see it, compared to what a female leopard would look like or male leopard, which are much smaller than that of the cheetah. So the research that we've done over the years has actually been groundbreaking. Nobody knew any of this. Now it's kind of common, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And then we talk about where cheetahs live. What is a habitat? Right. And this is another one of, I think, the, the, the questions study, yeah, that we ask. Yeah. Cheetahs like open spaces mm -hmm. uh, because they can see a very far distance. Yeah. Um, and what's happened in this country is we've ended up in many of the cheetah's ranges is through what we call bush encroachment. Right. We talk about our prey because the cheetah actually has to hunt. 
And we monitor the prey also through game counts. And from our game counts, we monitor our wildlife through uh, waterhole counts, through driving counts. And this gives us an idea of what is our number. It's a trend, right. I would say. And we teach this to the kids. Yeah. Uh, because I think Namibia being a um, integrated system with livestock and wildlife, all of our conservancies also do king counts on a regular basis. Right. And so it's become a part of really our culture. Absolutely. And with this, we also teach the kids that might have heard maybe from, you know, adults at home that maybe a goat was taken down by a cheetah, that the cheetah does not prefer to hunt their goats. This is what the cheetah prefers to hunt, um, natural prey out, uh, out in the wild. And we show this through some of the research again that we do, and we find scat, which is poop. We call it black gold. Mm -hmm. And that comes into um, one of three labs, actually. And one of the labs is that where we burn slides um, out of the cheetah's poop, and we look under the microscope at that, and we can find out what hair is in that scat, and we can tell them what the cheetah eats. From that, we know that, oh, kudu has been one of their favorite foods, right. They like eland, gemsbok, steenbok. Uh, females have a different size prey than males. Um, and no, a cheetah's not going to get a large, big bull kudu like the, that's an eland right. like this. But um, they will get the younger, the younger eland. Yeah. Uh, and so this has allowed us to share with the, with what we do with our students that come through. Right. Um, we have a variety of different predators that are here, and unfortunately, over time, people have done um, horrible things, like catch them in gin traps, mm -hmm. um, which we don't believe in. We believe in livestock management. And then we talk, yeah, what is a problem animal? Is it really a problem animal? Or is it problem people in the way that we necessarily right. manage our livestock? Which is, then we come into our whole systems here. Uh, because every country has a different kind of system that wildlife lives within. Um, for us, we have and have talked about here some of our habitat changes. We've got bush encroachment in the country, um, which we've talked about. We found cheetahs where we've seen in a back in the, the 1960s, we had really bad droughts. And then uh, with that, overgrazing occurred by the livestock. And we end up with this thick thorn bush, which has taken over a huge amount of our country. We've had bad droughts. A lot of the wildlife have died. We found cheetahs which scratched eyes because they're trying to hunt right here. And then our farming communities. So here in Namibia, we have commercial farms, communal farms, which are areas where at prior to independence, um, I think our tribes were put into their own different areas. Right. Pretty poor areas. I always say it's very similar to Indian reservations in America. And uh, from that, many of these have now become what we call conservancies. We have game farms, which are high game fence, right. yeah. which keeps animals inside of these fences, which isn't good. We really want movement, mm -hmm. yeah. um, especially when you have droughts. And that's why we support what are called conservancies. And these are where you've got um, no fences. Well, get, you can have cattle fences, which are not that high. Right. The wildlife can go over them, yep. under them. Cheetahs, the predators can all move. And we practice mixed farming. So right. protect your livestock, mm -hmm. have grass, have wildlife, and everyone can live it together. And then we can have also things like ecotourism, yep. which we have been very happy with. But right now we are in a lockdown and it will open. Um, there is sustainable utilization that goes on in our country. Mm -hmm. And the reason why... We can be a sustainable utilization is because of the amount of game counts we do, the amount of integration we do with our communities, right. the involvement that our government has, because maybe I think is different than every other country is that we work so closely with our communities. And then we talk about our bush block, but we're going to take you on a bush block um, tour at another point in time, but we made this thick and thorn bush into fuel logs, which has been quite fun. But this is my favorite, favorite, next favorite. My favorite one, I guess, is over there. But this is how we um, promote good farming practices uh, by having um, good friendly farming, small stock, 
corrals, herders, livestock guarding dog, um, calving camps, corrals, and using donkeys, for instance. This is another guarding animal. And this is what we teach through our Future Farmer of Africa right. training programs. Yeah. And we not only teach, but we actually practice what we preach. We've got our model here at farm, uh, um, at CCF to show farmers that it can actually work. Farmers and cheetahs can coexist if we just put this um, uh, various practices into place. And then that's why, uh, again, I like this, which is my favorite, which is called Mission Possible. Um, some of us my age would remember Mission Impossible, but we've crossed that out right. because it is possible. You can have nature, and it doesn't have to take away from your profits. Everybody wants profit. Yeah. What we teach is land management, livestock management, wildlife management. Mm -hmm. And from that, we can reduce... Problems that we have. We can think. We're human. We have good brains, and if we are given the right tools, and that's why I think our museum here is a good tool, right. we can, from there, um, do much better in the work that we do in managing our wildlife and our livestock here in Namibia. Obviously, CCF is all about conservation and really just teaching everybody out there that um, to live healthily in the environment that we live in, we have to take care of the environment. That means using our resources sustainably and very wisely. And that is um, what we should be doing in order to, to live um, in this world. And from here, we, uh, we call this the room of the future, actually. And what is the room of the future? And that is putting into practice yeah. our livestock herding dogs. And we talk about the importance of the dogs, that they save Cheetahs, dog saving cats, um, how you raise a livestock guarding dog. And then from that, uh, we also talk through here about who are the voices for the cheetah. Um, cheetah Conservation Fund has become that, but also our farmers are our conservationists. Right. Um, our training programs and future farmers of Africa. And that oh, we also bring up the fact of the illegal wildlife trade that we're dealing with today, unfortunately. In the Horn of Africa, we've got a lot of cubs being taken away. Uh, we do now have a sanctuary up in Somaliland as well, and we hope to eventually have an education center that is dealing with the things that we've been able to teach right. here right. that have been put um, conservation into practice. What does our research look like? The roles of zoos. What happens when you rewild a cheetah? Um, and then really, again, what our internship programs are. Right. Anarchy runs our internship program. We get students from all over the all place. Over the world. Um, um, we have students from, you know, our local universities here uh, coming to do internships that are or projects that are part of the programs or courses that they're doing at the university. And after six months, they have to present their project to us and also go back then and present to their university and write about. Uh, basically, everything centered around the cheetah and how we can understand the cheetah better. Also teaching um, about the cheetah and how we can help conserve the cheetah in these young minds. And it's just great because I think over the years here in Namibia, we've had probably well over 400 um, university students that have come on yes. six month, in, month internships right. here. Right. Yeah. And are, many of them are joined our staff, yes. but many of them are also in um, like the Ministry of Environment, yeah. um, the Ministry of Agriculture Absolutely. and Education. And so all of our research we talk about here, our vet clinic, our genetics lab, um, we talk about our livelihood development as well. Um, here, our livelihood programs are craft making, we make cheeses, we make wine, our bush plot. So, and then we come into our schools. So this is where, again, Anarchy spends much of her time Absolutely. and your staff's time. Yeah. yeah, and environmental education works. I always say that, you know, it takes a very long time to see um, the efforts of our environmental education programs. But let me tell you that I am a result of environmental education programs. So I used to come to CCF with my school and my church. And this is where I believe I fell in love with cheetahs and, 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 and conservation. So it's really about um, providing young people opportunities to what we have here in Namibia in terms of conservation and conserving our species. And I think a lot of people think that conservation is just about you know, going out and maybe tracking a cheetah right. or you know, the education process, that so all of us can grow up Absolutely. being conservationists. Absolutely. It's not just me or you or yeah. scientists. 
It is everybody plays a role. Uh, and so we work with communities on every aspect from going to deal with the farmer training, talking to farmers, um, talking everywhere, that bringing kids in with our um, art projects and, and education projects. So um, our outreach is far and wide. We not only outreach here in Namibia, we outreach to everybody around the world. Absolutely. We're outreaching to you yeah. right now Absolutely. to yeah. help you know about what we do, welcome you into our museum here, and help please spread the word that cheetahs are one of the most amazing animals. Um, with this, we might just end on what our vision statement is. And our, we've got a great uh, board of directors in uh, not only Namibia, but in the United States and in the UK and Canada and um, Italy right. and um, just from France. Mm -hmm. And what we are all looking at is seeing a world in which cheetahs live and flourish in coexistence with people and the environment. Yes. And if that's going to make happen, we have to make it Absolutely. happen. Yeah. And that's why our motto, again, being save the cheetah and change the world.